we are going to wrap up this chapter. Not too shabby, right? I mean, sometimes we were picking away at two verses. We did 30 verses in three meetings. That's pretty good timing for me. Seriously? Oh, uh, I love this thing. It's being weird again. All right, whatever, I don't care. Uh, Job 6, the last 10 verses of uh, chapter 6, as I was reading through them, I thought, boy, this is, look at the way Job is responding to Eliphaz. And it just, there were so many things that kind of hit home with me um, as I've witnessed for years and how people have responded to me as I've witnessed for the Lord. And so Job now, um, in the self-righteous and in this bitter and in a downtrodden and in a skeptical view, he is going to uh, show the hand, if you will, of people who are like him, skeptical, anti-Bible, not wanting to hear it, righteous, I'm good, I'm a good person, you know. And so we're going to see some neat things. Uh, his, his defense will be bitter, it will be dripping with sarcasm, and um, it will be aimed to hurt his attackers, um, namely Eliphaz and, and the others. And just, again, we're going we're to keep this in, in mind as we study, that we're going to treat this like Job is a lost man responding to you giving a gospel message. And it'll be interesting what we'll see here tonight. Um, so let's just pick right up in verse 21. Job says, For now are ye nothing. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. For now are ye nothing. Ye, ye see my casting down and are afraid. Now are ye nothing. Like, like You are like the waterless brook that we talked about. We talked about those verses last week. You, you guys are nothing. It's summertime. The heat is on in my life. I'm going through things that you have no idea about. It's scorching me up. And I've come to you for a little bit of water and you've got nothing to give me. But notice here that he says, he uses a plural pronoun. Ye. That's plural. Nobody else but Eliphaz has spoken at this point. So bef before the others even say a word, Job is already letting them know that anything that they have to say will amount to the pile of garbage that he's sitting on. He's not ready to hear anything. Again, this is going to provide an interest, it's going to give us some interesting information. And this is something I think we already know, but let's consider it for tonight. You will get lumped in with the company that you keep. That's in all walks of life, whether you're dealing with a lost person or not. You get, you get lumped in with the company you keep. They were with Eliphaz, therefore, in Job's bitter and angry mind, they are Eliphaz. And they're just as wrong as Eliphaz. And in particular, self-righteous skeptic is going to view every Christian just like the worst Christian that they know. I didn't say every person out there is going to view, every skeptic is going to view every Christian like the worst Christian they know. It just is. Get used to it. If you run into people that are of a skeptic nature, sometimes you can't blame them. We got people championing Jesus and championing, championing the Bible and saying some really horrible things. Just recently with this whole Orlando shooting, my, my favorite pastor and yours, Pastor Steven Anderson, out of Arizona, opened his mouth, um, and I, this is a quote from an article, his response, and of course they're going to go to him because of all the nasty things he says in the first place. So the newspapers run to him and he eats it up and he says, there's 50 less pedophiles in the world. That was his response. Well, number one, you don't even know if they're pedophiles. So you're just speaking like an ignorant person. And then he said a whole bunch of other nasty things and then concluded with this. People are going to start attacking Bible-believing Christians because of what this guy did, as in the Muslim that killed the 50 people in Orlando. Uh, actually, no, Mr. Anderson. They're going to start attacking Bible-believing Christians because of the things that you just said. 
And your taking pleasure in the death of them that die is not godly. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verses 30 through 32, and in 32 in particular, says that God takes no pleasure in the death of them that die. So if you're jumping up and down and rejoicing that 50 people died, there's something wrong with you. And wouldn't you know it, an anti-homosexual atmosphere perpetrated by Christians is what's being blamed instead of the religion of the moon god of the Kaaba. And that's it's, it's just what it, it just is. And of course then there's all our other buddies, the Westboro Baptist Church. Listen, we all need to witness. But there are some people that ought not open their mouths. So to Job... Every man associated with Eliphaz is Eliphaz. He's just, that's where he is, that's where he's... And listen, you've been in a bitter state at some point in time in your life as well. And, and no matter how much truth was presented to you, it didn't matter. You don't want truth, you want someone to agree with you and to sympathize with you. So, to, again, to Job, every man associated with Eliphaz is Eliphaz. To the skeptic and the hater of Christianity, we're all Stephen Anderson. We're all Westboro Baptist Church. Guilty by association. Doesn't matter if you do or don't associate. I have no association with them. <laughs> the name Jesus and the word Bible is the only association that bitter world needs. That's the association. And we are a representation of the worst to the bitter and the skeptical. To those who aren't bitter, to those who aren't skeptical, hopefully the reverse is true. That we will be a representation of the best. And so just keep these things, these are things that, not complaining, I'm just keep these things in mind as you witness. Expect some of these bitter responses to come up. Listen, you may have some repair work to do. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what form of Christianity they've been ex exposed to. You don't know what saved people have said to them or what religious and lost people have said to them in Jesus' name. You just don't know. He says, Ye see my casting down and are afraid in the same verse. In other words, you can't handle dealing with me now that I am the mess that I'm in. Some people get in a very low state. And it's not necessarily wrong that there are other people that don't have the strength to deal with that low state. I couldn't do it. Listen, I'll praise God for him, but I'll, I'll give accolades to Brother Pete Wigdor. I couldn't do what he does. So, don't tell him I said that, by the way. <laughs> um, go to Proverbs 17, 17. This is a good reference of which Job believes his friends are not a living example. You're afraid to deal with me. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loveth at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. You get He's not born for your success stories. It's not what the Bible says. Not, he's not born to share in the spoils. He's born for adversity. Job believes his friends have disappeared. They, he believes they went the moment he stopped being Job the Mighty and became Job sitting in a garbage pile scraping himself. Using Job is in our case study, for lack of some people believe that being a true friend means always agreeing, always backing them up, championing, championing every cause and every thought and every action of the other. 
that is not what a friend is. It's not Bible. It says that a friend loveth at all times. He loveth at all times. That doesn't mean he has to agree at all times or support you in the sin that you're in. He does not have to. Um, and we know the proverb, but go ahead and flip over to Proverbs 27. It's a Proverbs. Okay, so Proverbs 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Enemies kiss. They, they want to draw you in through deceit, through, through treachery. Honest, quite honestly, you say what you believe or what you think about me for saying this, but I believe that's our president. I believe he is a Muslim. And it is a part of being a Muslim to lie about being a Muslim in order to promote Islam. It just is. We all know it. Well, we know it. It's part of, part of their creed. So enemies, in order to gain a foothold, they will kiss. They will embrace. They will do, they will do things that are flattering. A real friend, they'll come up and say, you know, <laughs> crude as it is, you got a brother, you got a booger hanging out your nose. You got to just say that stuff sometimes. Right? If you're a friend, you will. Just pull them aside, you know. You're, gonna tell, you're not afraid to tell them the truth. Just give them the truth. A biblical friend speaks truth. However, we got to learn how and when. You say, well, always. Just always the truth. Give them the truth. Okay, I'm glad you're zealous, but you're not biblical. Let me show you. Uh, Proverbs 29. When you speak, yes, give them the truth. But that doesn't mean you always have to speak. Proverbs 29, and look at verse 11. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Afterwards what? Keeps it in until when? What's the presumption there? Until the appropriate time. Say, preacher, are you trying to tell us not to preach? No. Trust me. We'll, we'll get to it. Verses uh, 23, 22 and 23. Just letting you know, this is what you're dealing with. This is Job. Is, he's an angry, self-righteous, bitter skeptic who does not want to hear about God unless you're going to tell him something that he preconceives in his own heart about God. Agree with me? Or you're not my friend. Uh, verse, verses 22 and 23. He says, Did I say, bring unto me? Or give a reward for me of your substance? Or deliver me from the enemy's hand? Or redeem me from the hand of the mighty? You combine all four of those questions in those two verses and he's basically saying, did I ask you to help me? Come on, have you ever said something like that out of bitterness? Did I ask you to help me? That's bitterness speaking, plain and simple. Job wants these men to accuse God of unrighteous judgment right alongside of him. And they want to prove to him that he is the unrighteous one. Listen, Christian, this is just like our witnessing to a very stubborn and lost and a proud and a, and a man or a woman who thinks that they're good with God. Got to lay aside the fact that Job didn't sin as his friends insinuated or the fact that they will not speak rightly about God or of Job, but um, at least in all manners. Um, but again, let's just keep this all in light of dealing with a lost person tonight. We have to understand that they view our theology um, as an affront on their person and their personal character. It's not. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not an assault 
on somebody you're witnessing to. However, it is an affront on, a, on humanity as a whole. It's not, on a, it's not a matter of, I'm just, this is how they see it. You're attacking me. No, I'm not. I'm laying a foundation for all of humanity, of which you are a part of, but of which I also am a part. It's just not how they see it. What are we trying to accomplish when we witness? We want a soul to get saved, right? But there's two main points to any salvation message. Yes, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, but what did he die for? So you have to address sin. You have to. The Bible does it in a twofold way. So this, this is what we're trying to do. Here's a couple verses that magnify what we're trying to do. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam, all die. So now if I'm witnessing to Sister Sandy and she's a bitter and unsaved woman and she doesn't want to hear anything about the scripture and I go to start to... And when I say, in Adam, all die, she heard, oh, Sandy's going to die. That's what she heard. Oh, me, great, because I'm wicked, sure, and you're righteous. That's what she's hearing. But we, you, thank God the verse doesn't end there, right? It goes on to say, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So there's the first part. You, just, you get them to the sin, so they've got to just recognize uh, where, the, what their state is so that they'll reach out to the Savior. That's what we're trying to do. So yeah, we're, listen, we're all in Adam, not just Sandy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we're all in Adam. I am in Adam. <laughs> and Sandy, now your phone goes off, right? <laughs> and now it'll be on YouTube for all to see. <laughs> in Adam, all die, and we're all in Adam. Until we get in Christ. And we all have the opportunity to get in Christ. Alright? There's another verse. For the wages of sin is death. It's Romans 6.23. And we know uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. Right? That's the wages of that sin. We want to get that person to the second part of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We present an indictment against the whole of humanity and throw ourselves in that. That's what the Bible reveals. That there is none righteous, no, not one. That's Romans 3 and verse 10. They hear it as a personal attack on them. Understand this. So when they start snipping back or start making references against you, just understand where this is coming from. This way at least you're not then getting defensive on your own and lashing out in a wrong way from there. <laughs> and again, please know, I am not teaching that we, I am not trying to promote silence. You've got to know how and when. So here, let's just, just expect it. I'm, I'm going to just reiterate, here's a couple of things that we've already learned before we move on. Here's my caution. Keep, open your mouth. Open your mouth. But watch your associations. Because it doesn't matter how well you speak and how much truth you speak, if you're lumped in with a bad association, your testimony shot. And then don't be silent, but speak. But show yourself friendly first. First. Before you open your mouth, show yourself friendly. Again, and this is, it's hard to show yourself friendly out on a street corner. Right? So that's not what this is about. Eliphaz was a friend. This is a personal relationship. And this, this is about a personal witness. Okay, this isn't about standing on a street corner preaching. So in your personal relationship, show yourself friendly. A man that is to have friends must show himself friendly. Proverbs 18.24 And when you do that, 
the moment they are in need, you won't have to run to them with the gospel, and quite often, they'll just start asking and seeking. Just keep that in mind. Verse 24. Teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. And I said it that way because that's how I believe he said it. And I know, I believe, listen, and someone might argue with me, and I know that there are commentators that would. I believe that the words of Job right here in verse 24 are dripping with sarcasm. If Job truly wanted to hear the advice of his friends, why would he be arguing with them? He's so argumentative regarding their, their advice to ask for more to me anyhow. That's just, he's not truly interested. He's just... Oh, please, teach me. Go ahead, teach me. Sarcastic. Sarcastic in his response. Sarcasm has a few forms. Uh, there's jesting. There's using it to teach, and they're sort of acceptable. And then there's defensive and bitter, which is Job, and which can be quite off-putting. But that's where Job seems to be. So Job's belief system is what every grandmother taught us from our youth up. Ready? We've all heard this from Grandma. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Is that a true statement? Is that a good statement? Pardon me? It's from Bambi? It is from Bambi? Come on! Sandy, don't tell me you're watching Disney. You will totally blow my mind. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Here's the only problem with that. It's a semi-good statement. The problem is, is nice is very subjective. So what's nice to you isn't necessarily nice to, to me. Telling you you are dying without Christ and about to head to Satan's hell, that to me is nice. That's nice to me. It's not to a lot of people, <laughs> apparently. Um, and because Eliphaz ignored his grandmotherly proverb, Job is sarcastically lashing out in defense of bitterness. He doesn't want their advice, not unless it agrees with him. And that's how it'll be when you're witnessing with people. Sinners want a Christian. They desperately want a Christian to side with them and agree with them that they're really not as bad is their conscience tells them they are, but their heart then deceives themselves into disagreeing with. Their conscience knows it. Their heart rejects that conscience, the call of the conscience. So they, they just want you to just agree, you know, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad, I'm not like that guy. And when you don't, they will then, in self-defense... Seek out your life to find out where you don't measure up. I hope you don't give them too many opportunities. Because they're going to hone in and shine a light upon it because they desperately, if you're not going to tell them they're good enough, then they're going to want to show you how bad you are. And they're going to want to prove you to be a hypocrite. It just is. Job is showing himself this snide, please, oh, show me. Please, talk to me about God. Most men, the scripture says, will proclaim every one his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Proverbs 20, verse 6. So, most men want you Christians to agree that they are basically good. The problem is, is that we can't. Not without disagreeing with the Bible. And they won't hear that, you're, that you as well are a sinner. Because you're, you're saying you're going to heaven. It doesn't matter that you're talking about how Jesus got you to heaven. They hear it as, I'm not good enough, you are. That's for the bitter. We're dealing with a bitter person. Just expect it. Just expect it. Pray to the end that you might have an answer for the person that maybe would cause their heart to reconsider. Verse 25. How forcible are right words, but what doth your arguments reprove? 
How forcible. He's actually right here. He's saying, how forcible are right words? Well, what does your argument reprove? You might be saying some right things, but it has no, it's not correcting me. That's what he's saying. And he's actually right there, but man, oh man, how forcible are right words? You want to know how forcible right words are? They're quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's how forcible they are. They can pierce right down and, and, and split, split that bone and get right down into the marrow. The average self-righteous person cannot handle the force behind the Word of God. And so they lash out with their own words. They've been stabbed. What would you do if you got stabbed? Like a knife knife, you know. You would kick, fight, scream, attack back if you thought you were still under threat. They've been pierced through the heart with the Word of God. The Word of God condemns people. And guess what, Christian? You're the minister of that condemnation. It just is. So you're not convincing me to witness at all. We'll get to that. They'll respond with things like, ready, verses 26 and verses, verse 26 and 27. Let's just kind of put them together. Do you imagine to, rep to reprove the desperate that's verse 26. Do you really think you're going to... I'm a desperate man. Is, you came here to reprove someone who's in a desperate situation? Please, overwhelm the fatherless with your Bible. Verse 27. Yes, please, friends, dig a theological and religious pit for me who used to be your friend. Verse 27. All that's there. Again, I'm not saying that Job's resp response is correct. And I'm not condemning him either because I've never walked in his shoes. But I'm just showing you what to expect out of somebody who's hurting and who's bitter against God. These are things we ought to expect. Look at Psalm 33. Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of the Lord is what? Come on, you can do better than that. For the word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. Now what did Job just say in verse 25? How forcible are what words? Right words. Yeah, the word of the Lord is right. So the right word is the Bible word. It infringes upon humanity's freedom to sin without a care. It forces its way into their conscience and pierces them through with guilt. It digs a pit for them that they cannot climb out of themselves without help. However, the word also can clear their sin debt. It can guide the steps of their individual lives after salvation to the point of not feeling guilty anymore because you're not doing wrong. After it has dug a pit for the sinner, it then offers a rope in the person of Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is receive that rope. You don't even have to climb out. He'll pull you out. You just got to receive it. That's all you got to do. So it's a double-edged sword. For the skeptical, it's just too painful and too piercing. And they're in too much bitterness and anger that they just don't want to see the softer side of the word. They only hear, in Adam all die. They only hear, for the wages of sin is death. They don't get the second part of the verse because they've shut their ears to it. Verse 28. So they'll say things like, Now therefore be content, look upon me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. What, what, is, what is he saying? What does that mean? Job is saying, well, 
isn't it obvious that you guys think you know everything? So go ahead, proclaim what you want to proclaim. Take a look at me. You're going to know if I'm a liar. You know if I lie, because you know everything. This is why self-righteous people believe you're self-righteous. It's not because you're walking around. No Christian here that's actually proclaiming the gospel is walking around proclaiming their own goodness. Right? I'm a wicked sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's my message to you. But when you're quoting the Bible, you have answers to questions that he can't possibly have. And he thinks you're a know-it-all for it. Mainly because he doesn't like the answers. If, you, if, the, if he agreed to the answers, then he would be, friend, good job, yeah, I agree with you. But because he doesn't, then you're just a know-it-all. So you, in turn, you are the self-righteous know-it-all. And he hates you for it. It enrages them. He assumes you think you're better. You think you know more. But it's a prideful response. That's all it is. It's just pride kicking out against the Bible. Remember in our armor study I said that when it comes to the sword of the Spirit, you are going to have to be okay with being offensive. Not in personality. You are going to have to be okay to hurt somebody. You know why I couldn't? I can't be a nurse. I could never be a nurse. You know why? Because I can't stick anybody with a needle. Couldn't do it. I hate hurting people. Drives me insane. I can't pull my son's tooth out when it's dangling there. I just, I don't, I, I'm way more hurtful with words than I am. But in a physical sense, I can't, I can't, I don't want to hurt anybody ever. It's just, it's, it's just not in me. Um, Those words that we use, they can, be, they can be offensive, they can be hurtful to people. I am not saying don't use them. You're going to have to be okay with it. You're going to have to be okay with picking up a needle and sticking it in their arm. Much of what Job is doing in response. Again, I haven't walked in his shoes. But it's the response of a man who truly believes he's good. And we know when God shows up, he will reprove Job. Job is not as good as he thinks he is. But he thinks he's good and that any God that would judge him otherwise is an unjust God. You tell me you don't, you don't experience that with bitter, lost people? They say things like, what kind of a loving God would cast a man into hell for all of eternity? The response I would love to give, but I can't give, is what kind of a proud and stupid individual would refuse the lifeline before that God casts you into hell? Can't say things like that, so I don't. Verses 29 and 30. He says, Return, I pray you. Let it not be iniquity. In other words, just return. Go back to where you came from before you really say something that's going to get you in trouble. That's what he's saying. Is there iniquity in my tongue? He says. I'm the one that's speaking right. It ain't you. Cannot my taste... Or, cannot my taste discern perverse things? You don't think I know as much about God as you think you know about God? I'm the one who's correct. You guys are the ones who are wicked. It's all there in verses 29 and 30. You just got to pay attention to the words. See what they're saying. Job is he's saying, what I believe and what I teach is just as good as what you believe and what you teach. Here's the modern equivalent. Aren't all religions the same? Don't we all worship the same God and just use a different name? Well, as long as you believe in something. 
Just go your way before our relationship is damaged. Don't you remember the good old days? Come on, when we used to hang out at the pub together? Don't you remember those? Those were the good old days. Don't, do you want to ruin this relationship forever? You with this Bible talk, this Jesus talk? You're going to mess things right up. Listen, we've already parted ways. We've already parted. Because I'm heading to heaven. I'm on a different road. Come on, last verse. You probably know where I'm going. Go to Amos 3 and verse 3. Final verse for tonight. Christian, are there any, are there any unsaved people that you've had to lose associations with over the years? Did you try to lose their association? Or did you just go with them, with the Bible, talk about the Lord, maybe not do some things that were right, like Eliphaz, Maybe not say everything perfectly about God as you thought you or had hoped to, like Eliphaz. But you ended up angering your friend. Before long, you couldn't be in the same room. And all they wanted to do was go back to the good old days, and all you want to do is to bring them to heaven with you. But as Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? What's the answer? No. You can get ready. I'm going to make every liberal happy. You can coexist. But you can't walk together. So you're going to be over there walking your path and I'm going to be over here walking my path and we can both walk a path and we can coexist. As long as your idea of coexist doesn't mean me agreeing with everything that you're wrong about. You're going to walk there, I'm going to walk here, and the best of friends. Je Listen, Jesus wasn't wrong. He came to divide. And I've got a number of those examples in my life as well. So I just thought this was interesting as I was reading through these verses. Wow, look at, look at Job responding, if I've not heard these words before. And I have. Discussion, comments, questions. Everyone wants to go home. Nothing to say, really? Okay. Brother Joe, will you close us in prayer?